Good morning, and thanks for joining us today for our webinar entitled, New Laws for 2019, What You Need to Know. I'm Denise Keddy, your moderator for this session, and I'm gonna go over a couple quick housekeeping notes before I introduce today's panel of expert, experts today. The webinar will run 60 minutes in total. Please take a moment right now to visit the handout area on your dashboard to download a copy of today's presentation. If you have questions during the presentation, please post them on the Q&A area that's located on your dashboard at any time during the presentation. If you would like your question directed to a specific panelist, you can note that when you're sending in your question. If you have any issues during the presentation, you can email me directly at denisemketty at gmail.com. Just a quick reminder that today's presentation is being recorded and all accompanying materials are protected by copyright. Our presentation today provides general information and does not constitute mm -hmm. legal advice. The information offered during the webinar is as of today, December 13th, 2018. As always, we recommend that you consult with your own legal counsel to address your specific situation to ensure that you have the most current information on all legal matters. Let's get our session started today. A new year brings new beginnings, and of course, that will mean new labor laws in California that will impact your business. Our legal expert today is Curtis Urian. Curtis is an associate at the law firm of Murhab Robinson, Jackson and Clarkson, in the firm's transactional department, where he advises clients in real estate, finance, business succession planning, corporate, and employment law. In addition to his outstanding work at the firm, Curtis has contributed articles to law journals and is a part-time lecturer and teaches classes on economics, conscious capitalism, and business law. He has also been recognized by superlawyers in 20, superlawyers.com in 2017 and 2018 as a rising star in Southern California. Our human capital expert is Linda Duffy, president of Ethos Human Capital Solutions. Linda and her team are well known for building the magic of human connection with their consulting, recruiting, training, and also payroll support programs. The Ethos team works with your company by developing strategies for business leaders to get the right systems, people, and culture in place within your organization so that you as a business owner can focus on running your business and achieving your goal. Her clients range from high-tech businesses to manufacturing firms to nonprofit organizations, and Linda is, and her team are extremely well-versed in addressing the concerns of founder CEO-led businesses. Linda, could you get us started this morning? I can, Denise. Thanks so much for that introduction, mm -hmm. and thanks for joining us today. Uh, we have a short agenda because this is uh, one of the presentations we do every year, and instead of going through all of them in detail on this page, we'll just speak to them. So we'll go through the updates and legislative changes. Uh, Governor Brown, at the end of September in particular, signed a whole slew of new laws into place. Many of them impact uh, employ employers in California, so we'll review those. Uh, the good news is there aren't a ton of really significant ones. There's a couple that are significant, but uh, for the most part, there's clarifications and slight changes to existing law. Um, so that's good. And then uh, Curtis is going to speak to some case law that's happened over the course of the, of the year and then also let you know sort of what's pending, what's out on the horizon, and how that may impact you as an employer as well. And then, as always, uh, we will take any sort of questions and give you some answers at the end of this. So uh, we always plan the presentation to run about 40, 45 minutes. So if you have questions, as Denise said, just type them into the side and we'll take a look at those at the end. One thing that always happens now for us sitting in California, every year minimum wage goes up. So right now you can see on the top line there, uh, for those of you with, employ with employees of 25 or fewer, you're at 10, 15 an hour, that's gonna go up to $11 an hour uh, next month. And if you have an employer with 26 or more employees, it's gonna go up to $12 an hour. Uh, the Labor Commissioner recommends that if you reach that threshold of 26 employees at 
any point in a pay period that you pay your workers at the minimum the higher minimum wage rate for the duration of the entire pay period and then continue to do so until you drop down uh, below that for an entire pay period so even if it's just for one day they say just go back and for the entire pay period pay everybody at the higher rate so let's also remember that different uh, localities in the state of California have their own minimum wages. I think we're up to 22, and I have a slide on that in a second. Uh, the one that comes into play a lot for those of us in Orange County uh, is Los Angeles. The city of Los Angeles has their own schedule. Uh, you can see it's also staggered dates. So while where California goes up on the first of every year, the city of Los Angeles goes up on July 1st of every year. So they're, you know, already ahead of us by quite a bit. And come July, you know, they're going to be, you know, over $2 an hour, $2.25 an hour, uh, more than what the state minimum wage is. Now, what's significant about this is if you have an employee who works two or more hours in the city of Los Angeles during a week, it does trigger the requirement to pay the higher minimum wage. You also, in the case of Los Angeles, have a higher sick pay benefit you have to comply with. So you wanna make sure that you're really paying attention, especially like we've got some clients that are in the logistics business that have truck drivers. You know, if they go to make deliveries in the city of Los Angeles with traffic, it would be super easy, especially if it was a daily route, super easy to spend more than two hours in the city of Los Angeles during the week. So you're gonna wanna take that into consideration and make a decision as to whether or not you just wanna always pay the higher minimum wage or you want to actually track that. Okay, so as I mentioned, in addition to the city of Los Angeles, we also have local minimum wages throughout the state. So 22 different localities that I could find um, are higher than the state's minimum wage. So you can take a look at these. Now, keep in mind that it's not just minimum wage. Many of these cities have separate sick pay requirements that are higher than the state of California's, and some of them have higher leave of absence requirements as well. So like San Francisco in particular has a mind of its own, right? And they have a, a lot higher benefit when it comes to sick, but they also have uh, some leave of absence requirements that are not imposed throughout the state of California. So anytime you have employees, even if it's just one employee in one of these cities, you wanna make sure you're checking with us or checking with Curtis and his firm um, or your own employment attorney to get an understanding of those local requirements. Make sure that you're in compliance with all of those. There are other impacts when we talk about minimum wage. Most importantly, probably, is that the minimum salary for the white collar exemptions that are contained in the wage orders uh, goes up as well. We calculate that based on the state minimum wage, not the local one, okay? So even if you're in the city of Los Angeles or San Francisco or San Diego or whatever, you're still going by the state minimum wage. So if you have 25 or fewer employer, employees, come the first of the year, you need to make sure that anyone in that executive, professional, or administrative categories is being paid at least a salary of 45,760 per year. If you have 26 or more employees, then you know it needs to be 49,920. Now, when we go in to do audits of clients uh, and we just take a quick look, we'll ask for a report of everybody and how much they're making. And we can quickly eyeball this. We just go down, as does the state of California, EDD, anybody else is gonna audit you. And if we, if we know that you have 26 or more employees, for example, and we see salaries that are less than 49,920 come the first of the year, we already know you're not in compliance. So you really wanna make sure you review this, make sure that everybody's at that level. There are, of course, duty requirements as well, but just speaking relative to the salary requirements, take a look at that. Also, you want to keep in mind that your posters must be updated. So most people, you know, have those laminated posters or they have something that they've downloaded that you're posting and you want to make sure that you're updating that where it shows the minimum wage. And then the other thing to keep in mind is the wage compression issue. And by that, what I mean is you already have some employees who are going to be 
pay, let's say, at an $11 rate. Maybe they've been with you for a while. You brought them in at minimum wage at $10.50. Now they're at 11 and then come the first of the year, now you're bringing everybody up to 11. You're bringing new hires in at 11. Um, and so you have to take a look at that and ask yourself whether or not you need to bump up those people that are at the lower end of your range and what that fiscal impact is going to be to your business. But you want to make sure that you're being thoughtful about that. Uh, it's going to be a huge morale issue, if nothing else, if people are all of a sudden training you know, new hires that are making the same amount of money as they are. So just think about that. There are a couple of other special minimum wage rates that you want to pay attention to. Uh, computer professionals, and again, you want to make sure um, when we're talking about computer professionals, there's a specific definition in the wage orders for that. Um, but if you have a computer professional, we're talking about you know people who are developing software, managing the enterprise level, not help desk people, uh, that you're paying them at this rate. And you can see the rate is super high. So at $45.41 $45 per hour as of the first of the year, um, or you know 94.6 in terms of a salary. So that's a very high standard for computer professionals to meet. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind on the computer professionals, I do not know how the state of California calculates this. Um, for most of us, we would take that $45.41 and multiply it by uh, 2080, 2080 hours in a year to get the annual amount. If you do that, you'll see that it comes out to $94,452.80, which is about $150 short of this number. So do not ask me how they calculated this. Just recognize that it's not the same. Um, it's not the way most of us do the calculation. And so if that's the case, you want to make sure that if you are quoting somebody per year or per hour per month, that you're using the correct number. Okay, uh, licensed physicians, $82.72 per hour is the new rate effective January 1st for them. Um, and this is just an indexed rate. Every year, the state of California at the end of October uh, puts out a publication that shows what it's going to be for the coming year. So just know that this goes up every single year. All right, so that's the minimum wage, um, always significant in the state of California. And then let's look at some bills that are uh, going to have some sort of impact on businesses in the first of the year. So most of these bills, as I mentioned before, are clarifying existing law, and this is one of them. So paid family leave has been in place in California for the last few years. It's being expanded not this year, but in 2021. So we're just giving you a preview. Uh, for family members who have a member in the U.S. Armed Services. If there is a covered activity, you, the employee can get some supplemental pay through the state of California. So those activities are things like attending official mil military ceremonies, counseling, things like that. Uh, in this case, they define family member very specifically as a spouse, registered domestic partner, child, or parent. So it's very specific to that group of people. Um, it does just, you have to remember that paid family leave is such a misnomer. It does not provide a leave of absence. So this bill does nothing in terms of granting time off for those covered activities. It just says if you're granted time off under FMLA, under a company policy, under something, so you have the time off, you can then submit uh, to get the supplemental pay under the paid family leave. All right, the next one is Senate Bill 1252. Uh, this clarifies actually Labor Code Section 226. So the Labor Code already provides that employees are are given the right to inspect or copy the payroll records within 21 days of their request. Okay, it's 30 days for payroll. I'm sorry, 21 days for payroll and 30 days for their employee file. So if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I want to look at my payroll records or if I want to copy my payroll records, how the law reads right now is that you need to give them the right to inspect or copy those records. Well, what the state wanted to do was make it a little bit easier on employees. And so it now says that you have to provide the copies if that's how the employee wants to do it rather than telling them that's fine, you can copy them, make arrangements to copy them, right? And have them try to figure out how to do that. So if somebody comes to you and makes a request for a copy of the payroll records, you can charge them the actual cost of reproduction. You can't mark it up, but the actual cost of reproduction 
um, but you would be required to actually give them copies of their records as opposed to just giving them access to those records. The next bill is Senate Bill 970, and this is on human trafficking awareness training. So I don't remember if it was last, I think it was last year or effective, I should say 2018, there was a requirement for posters in, in some specific industries like hotels and motels in particular, places where they know human trafficking uh, could be an issue. And so this law actually amends the Fair Employment and Housing Act to require those same employers that are covered uh, by providing at least 20 minutes of training and education regarding human trafficking awareness and specifically to employees who are likely to interact with victims. Um, so they go on to explain who that is, but it's basically public facing employees, as you can imagine. Uh, you have to have the training provided by next January and then every two years after that and within six months of hire or someone being transferred into one of those roles that's public facing. Uh, they're also very specific in the bill about what has to be included in the uh, the training. So for example, uh, it includes the definition of human trafficking and commercial exploitation of children. There's guidance on how to identify individuals who are at most uh, risk for human trafficking. Um, the difference between labor and sex trafficking specific to the hotel sector, guidance on the role of hospitality employees and reporting and responding to the issue, and then also you need to provide the contact information for appropriate agencies, like there's a national human trafficking hotline, that type of thing, and then local law enforcement. So that's something you'll wanna to put together if you are in that hotel industry um, and just need to be 20 minutes in length. All right, lactation accommodation, it's already part of the law. Uh, AB 1976 actually brings California law into conformity with federal law in terms of the language used. So right now, uh, what California law has read is you have to allow women to express breast milk uh, in some sort of dedicated space other than a toilet stall. This will change the law to read other than a bathroom. And I know for some companies that's a huge burden just based on, you know, the lack of space, based on like where else are we going to put this person. Um, you know, the law wants you to provide some sort of permanent mother's room unless it's not feasible. Uh, there is an undue hardship exemption that, you know, they'll, they will consider, but just remember it's the burden is on the employer to prove that it's an undue hardship. And I have to tell you, and Curtis will tell you the same thing, that's a really high standard for most employers to meet. Um, they will take into consideration the size of your business, the nature of the business, the structure, everything, but just know you should really go out of your way to try to find that space if at all possible, and it cannot be in a bathroom. All right, salary history. So you'll remember the January 1st of this year, uh, it, it imposed the uh, prohibition about asking about salary history when you're interviewing a candidate or on your job application forms. So AB 2282 clarifies some of the ambiguities, not all of them, but some of them, uh, regarding uh, the ban on asking about salary history. So it does now confirm in writing what we all interpreted this to mean anyway last year, which is you can ask about an applicant salary expectations, right? We always counsel our clients, don't ask about history, but you can ask forward looking questions like, hey, how much are you expecting to be paid in this job? What are your salary requirements? Anything like that that does not base it on what they were making before. Okay. It also goes on to clarify that an applicant re can request a written pay scale, which was part of the law. Now it specifically says after completing an initial interview. So they can't just walk in and say, give me an application and oh, can I see the pay scale, right? So after completing an initial interview. Curiously to me anyway, they do not extend that to current employees. I'm not sure why the reason is, but there's no requirement to give that pay scale to, to current employees. Um, but it does say for applicants and the pay scale uh, need only include salary or hourly ranges. It doesn't have to go into a lot of detail on that. All right, the big one for this year, <clears throat> excuse me, the big one for this year is SB 1343. You, if you, you've probably already heard about this, but if you haven't, uh, it's going to require employers with five or more employees 
to provide sexual harassment prevention training to all employees by January 1st of next year, and then every two years after, and then with six, within six months of higher promotion. So up until now, the requirement has been if you have 50 or more employees in California, then your managers and supervisors have to have two hours of anti-harassment training every other year and within six months of hire or promotion into a supervisory position. This now is gonna drop it down to employers with five or more employees, and it's also going to add a second burden of training all of your, I should say opportunity, to train all of your employees in harassment prevention training. For employees, it's one hour of training every two years, and for supervisors, it remains the two hours. So that's a big change, and you're gonna wanna make sure uh, that you think about how you want to accomplish that, and I'll give you some options in a second of how Ethos can do that for you. Um, the other thing to note is that if you have um, seasonal or temporary employees, not in 2019, but in 2020, uh, any employee who's hired to work for less than six months must receive the training within 30 calendar days or within 100 hours of work, whichever occurs first. If they're working full time, that's within the first two and a half weeks. So this is another even stronger standard they are gonna have to think about. So this doesn't matter if you're bringing somebody on board on payroll or if you're going through an agency, that same requirement exists. But the law does say if you bring somebody in from a temp agency, it's a, the temp agency's responsibility to provide the training to that employee, not yours. So the temp agencies are gonna have to figure out how to make that part of their onboarding. There's also um, another requirement that goes into effect January of 2020, having to do with migrant and seasonal agricultural workers. Um, we don't have most of those people on this call, so we're not gonna go into detail. So just keep in mind, five, em five employees or more, everyone in the state of California is gonna get trained starting next year. And I have to say, you know, if you talk to people uh, like from the Department for Employment and Housing, they'll tell you in-person training is always gonna be the most effective, right? Also, if you take a look at the requirement in the state of California, um, you have as an employer requirement to pr provide a workplace free of sexual harassment discrimination. So the question is always, how do you do that? Uh, if you're not training your employees, you're gonna have a really hard time if somebody goes rogue, sexually harasses somebody, and then you know somebody comes knocking and saying, well, tell us the steps you took and you haven't taken any to do training, it's gonna be a problem probably. So Quickly on what we're doing next year, um, we already do a lot of this training as well. We can come to your, you know, in person to do it at your office. We will be hosting public events. We haven't scheduled those yet, but we'll probably do those every quarter, every quarter or so. Um, so we can pick up any stragglers that missed uh, ones that are at your office, but also, you know, if you just have five people, you might want to send them that way as you know, as opposed to having us come in. Uh, we can do a live webinar that's specific to your company where, you know, especially if you have employees scattered, it makes it a lot easier sometimes. We have um, scenarios and polls built in, so they actually have to respond online. We also will offer some live webinars for the public. We have access to canned webinars that another company produced, and so, um, for one-off people, sometimes that's easiest to give them access to those. And then also for those of you that are thinking, like we had a client recently ask us to do this for them. They're like, we just wanted part of our onboarding. We need something that we can just have them watch as soon as they start because you do have that requirement for in the initial six months to give them training. Um, and so they want us to just customize a recorded webinar that they can have, that they can own. So we can do that as well, many other ways. Uh, also, all of our training can be done in English or Spanish. So if you have Spanish-speaking employees, uh, just keep that in mind. We also, you have the requirement to have a policy in writings. We can develop that for you. And we also have a confidential hotline for reporting incidents and issues. So if you're interested in any of that, please just reach out to me and we're happy to get that scheduled uh, for you for uh, next year. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Curtis, who is going to talk about a couple other bills and then go through some of the case law and then we'll take your questions. Curtis? Yes, thank you, Linda, and thank you, Denise, for the introduction. I'm gonna pick up here with AB 2770, and this is stemming off of Linda's last discussion on some bills that relate to sexual harassment pr protection. AB 2770 relates to a, a, 
an accused harasser's ability to make a file a defamation lawsuit. Uh, sometimes what has been happening in the state is uh, an alleged harasser or a, an employee goes to employer, makes a complaint, or alleges harassment, and regardless of the, the veracity of the claim, the alleged, har the alleged harasser wants to prove outside of the investigation that the, the, the alleged harasser didn't do anything wrong, so the alleged harasser has been found sometimes to file a defamation lawsuit. Defamation is a false statement that injures a person's reputation. And if the idea is that if the public sees that an alleged harasser is suing for defamation, that must mean that the alleged harasser is, is innocent because they want to fight so hard and do everything that they can to prove that they didn't do anything wrong. And so that kind of has a chilling effect on speech for employees who actually are victims of sexual harassment. And so the state wants to prevent that from happening. And in that same line, when an employer then terminates an employee for engaging in sexual harassment or unlawful discrimination, and that employee goes and applies for a job with another employer, Oftentimes, that employer is going to want to do an employment reference check. And employers, the previous employers, are again subject to defamation laws. They are not capable of making statements that might be false that could injure a person's reputation. So, what this law does is it allows the previous employers to state to a potential employer that the Terminated employee is not on a rehire status because of complaints of harassment or discrimination. So this is providing more protections for those who are victims of harassment or unlawful discrimination. And it's also designed to discourage uh, individuals who would otherwise be harassers. And in that same line, the legislature also passed some laws regarding settlement agreements for instances of sexual harassment. It's very common practice to include a confidentiality clause in a settlement agreement. But what these laws are doing now are prohibiting confidentiality clauses in settlement agreements relating to sexual harassment. So now we have an outright ban on any settlement agreement for a sexual harassment claim from including a confidentiality clause. And the, the idea here is that we, the, the public the legislature doesn't want to suppress information on harassers. They, the, the legislature wants this information to be public knowledge to discourage people from engaging in harassment activities. And as a, a, a note as well, the recent tax law that went into effect this year disallows a deduction for settlement payments that come from a settlement agreement that has a confidentiality agreement for a sexual harassment claim. And uh, the, the new laws also bar settlement agreements that prevent uh, victims from testifying in legal or, or legislative proceedings in cases involving criminal conduct or sexual harassment. And again, in this in this same vein, the legislature passed Senate Bill 1300, which provides even more sexual harassment protection. This bill is really designed for litigators, for defense and plaintiffs' attorneys. There have been several cases in, in recent history that affects the burden for proving sexual harassment or hostile work environment. And there are some cases that the legislature liked and some cases that the legislature didn't like. So basically what's going on here is the legis legislature is adopting opinions that they've liked and prohibiting parties from relying on opinions that the legislature doesn't like. Specifically, 
the, this bill is also stating that employers can be liable for sexual harassment conduct of non-employees by bystanders. So let's say you have an employee walking along the street performing their essential job functions and that, empl and that employee is attacked, sexually harassed, sexually assaulted. The employer could p potentially be liable for that conduct under this new bill. And there are some other other things under this law that quite don't that don't quite make sense to us. For example, this law states that uh, employers are authorized to provide bystander harassment training. We're not really sure what the point of saying authorized is, because we didn't really think that we couldn't do it before, and this doesn't really create an affirmative requirement to do it now. But since employers can be liable for it, liability has been expanded, uh, employers can think about it. it, it perhaps the legislature wants to bring uh, bystander training into the forefront of people's minds. And also in SB 1300, uh, it, it prohibits employers from requiring employees to sign a, a release in exchange for getting a bonus or a salary increase. And this, this requirement is a little confusing as well. It, it needs to be pointed out that the, the purpose of this requirement, or the purpose of this prohibition is to prevent blanket or standard settlement agreements in exchange for a, a bonus or uh, a pay increase. It does allow settlement agreements when an employee has actually made a complaint and there's been an investigation or if an employee has actually gone to an administrative agency and made a complaint. And th that's it for new laws from the legislature that are going to affect uh, this next year that are affecting employers. But we just want to do a, a quick review here on cases from this last year that affect employers as well. And the first, it's probably the worst that we've talked about many times before. And we just want to do a quick review of this is the, the Dynamics case, Dynamex. This case has to do with classifying employees versus classifying independent contractors. Previously, the law was that uh, in a, a, a hiring entity could classify a worker as an independent contractor if under considering certain factors, the, the employer could demonstrate that the, the person really should be an independent contractor. The court changed that test, and now we have the ABC test. And under the ABC test, it says that instead of when a worker comes to a company and starts doing services, we, we do an analysis to figure out whether they should be an employee or an independent contractor. Now that worker is just automatically presumed to be an employee, and if the employer wants to classify that worker differently, then the employer must demonstrate that the worker meets the ABC test. A, requirement, worker must be free of the control and direction of the employer. B, requirement that the work performed by the hiring entity must be different than the work performed by the, uh, by the, by the worker. And third, that the worker has to independently establish the worker's own trade, business, or occupation. And the dynamics case applies to all hiring entities in California, and it is retroactive. So it is going to go back in the past and tell you that if you've had independent contractors in the past based on old laws, that you may have misclassified them. So I don't want to beat the, the horse too much on this case, but the takeaway is we really need to reevaluate our independent contractors and our business models. My firm has been dealing with this case very frequently since it came out. We have many clients who've come to us and said, we have independent contractors, what do we do? 
So that's been a, a very common question that we've been getting, and we are still dealing with it today, and we'll probably be dealing with it for the next little while. So some last thoughts on Dynamex. The, there was a case, Garcia versus Border Transportation Group, in the last few months that clarified Dynamics, Dynamics and stated that the ABC test only applies to classifying employees under the wage orders. Now, this is a little confusing because we have the common law test for, for the, the common law definition for employees from Borello, and we have the, the labor code definition of an employee from the actual state legislature, and now we have a third definition of employee from that only applies to the wage orders. So the question is, let's say I have a worker who sues me for various employment wage and hour claims, and I say, no, this, this person was an independent contract, not an employee. Well, now I have to prove that this person was an independent contractor for wage order claims, and I have to prove that this person was an independent contractor for labor code claims. For example, waiting time penalties are not in the wage orders. Waiting time penalties only come from the labor code. Also, penalties for inaccurate wage statements. Those come from the labor code. Those don't come from the wage orders. And so there's some confusion on what do we do going forward? And the safer, the more conservative thing to do if you're an employer is to just classify workers as employees or come up with a, a business model where it's more, more effective to not have independent contractors. And then we have another case, California Trucking Association versus Javier Becerra, the Attorney General of the state, saying that this is effectively a new law. The court was legislating from the bench and that this new law violates the supremacy clause of the Constitution. Because let's think about uh, commercial truckers who drive from state to state, they cross the border. Let's say in Nevada, they could be properly classified as an independent contractor, but as soon as they cross the border with their haul into California, they have to be classified as an employee. This creates a burden on those hiring entities. And so the California Trucking Association, and there's a few other trucking associations as well, are asking the federal court to say that the Dynamex case is unconstitutional and that we don't have to follow it. But that's a pending case. We'll see where it goes. Just to review some other cases that we've uh, we've talked about uh, throughout the year here. Schroeser versus Starbucks. This is a rejection of the de minimis rule. The de minimis rule says that employers do not have to record small increments of time worked that are too small to effectively or administratively count and are so small that it's really not going to affect the employee's pay. What was happening here with Starbucks is their, their evening managers would clock out, start or initiate the security system, lock the door, and throw a bag of trash in the dumpster. In that time, starting the security system, locking the door, throwing trash away, may have been two or three minutes. Under the federal law, which, which includes the de minimis doctrine, federal law says we don't have to record that time because it's too administratively difficult to do that, and you don't have to pay it. And there are many California employers that have relied on this federal law and have used the de minimis doctrine. Well, some individuals have decided they would sue Starbucks, claiming that the de, the de minimis rule does not actually exist in California law. It's not on any labor code section, and it's not in any California Supreme Court ruling. And if you were to analyze the express black and white letter of the law, you won't find the de minimis, de minimis rule anywhere, even though it's a federal law that makes sense and that everyone relies on. So the California Supreme Court rejected the de minimis rule and stated that employers must pay for small amounts of time 
that are not on the clock that are actually work, such as locking the door. But this is an interesting concept, the idea that California is not going to honor rules or is not going to honor laws that don't specifically exist on any California Labor Code section, even though they exist in federal law. And so this makes me wonder about the rounding practice. Many employers have one time clock and a large group of employees that all need to clock in on time. And let's say it takes 10 seconds for an employee, that's only six employees that can clock in on time. So many employers adopt a rounding policy that says, employee, well, you can clock in five minutes early, just don't work. And as soon as eight o'clock, as soon as we get to eight o'clock, then you can start working. So that way, employees can be on time without having to clock in right at eight o'clock. But the, the, this practice of rounding is not found in the labor code, is not found in any California Supreme Court case. We do have the C's candy case that says rounding to the nearest five or 10 minute case, or five, near, nearest, rounding to the nearest five or 10 minutes is acceptable and grace periods are acceptable, but that's a court of appeal case. And that court of appeal case was uh, relying on federal law. And so recently we had the AHMC healthcare versus superior court case, which asked whether rounding to the nearest quarter of an hour is permissible. And the court here, this is an appellate case, relied on seize candy and other federal laws and saying that, yeah, employers, you can round to the nearest quarter of an hour as long as your rounding policy is neutral and it's space. I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna be fair and it's gonna apply to everyone and it's to for clocking in and clocking out. And it's gonna be neutral as actually applied, meaning when an employee clocks in a few minutes early, the employee doesn't work until they're actually scheduled to start working. And in this case, the named plaintiffs were found to have worked an extra maybe three hours over the course of their employment that they weren't paid for. But for the majority of all the other employees, they were found to have been overpaid a few minutes. So the court in this case said, rounding is okay. But we now have Trosa versus Starbucks that says, even though we have a federal law that says we can do something, because it doesn't exist on California books, we're not going to uphold it. So we'll see what the, what the future of rounding is. Right now, as it appears, rounding timekeeping policies are permissible, but we'll see where that goes. A few other cases we want to mention here real quick. We have Epic Systems Corp versus Lewis. This is regarding uh, employees signing arbitration agreements that include a class action waiver. Uh, California courts really don't like employees to sign arbitration agreements and they don't like employees to sign class action waivers. And what these agreements say is that an employee is going to, instead of suing in court for, in public court for employment claims, they must bring their claims in private arbitration. And the class action waiver says that instead of filing a class action of everyone similarly, similarly situated to you, uh, you are going to bring your claim individually in arbitration. So employers really like arbitration agreements. They really like class action waivers because it keeps claims private and it keeps claims in arbitration and it prevents class action waivers. Cal and so arbitration agreements, class action waivers, they benefit employers. What does California do? They like to benefit employees. So they say, have said in the past, arbitration agreements and class action waivers are not enforceable. Well, the problem with that is there's a Supreme Court case, the United States Supreme Court, that said that class action waivers are permissible. So there's been a split of authority, and this last summer, Epic Systems Court versus Lewis came before the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled again that class action waivers are permissible, and that arbitration agreements are permissible and that overruled several California court opinions saying, claiming otherwise. 
in like our like you can expect our legislature to do they decided to codify a law that says that employees may not sign arbitration agreements thankfully governor brown departing governor vetoed that bill and so we don't have to worry about that as of now but we'll see what happens with the new california administration quickly janice versus afs cme the states that Members of public unions can opt out of certain union fees, union dues. And that's all I'm gonna say there. Newland versus County of Los Angeles. This is a case where an employee clocked out at the end of the day. County was an employee of the County of Los Angeles, clocked out, drove home, while driving home, got an accident, injured Newland. Newland sued everybody in existence and won a judgment against the County of Los Angeles, the employer of the driver, the employee driver. And the court held that no, the county is not responsible for the employee's conduct during a commute, which is a win for employers. We didn't get many this year, but we did get a couple. And the last case I wanna talk about real quick is AMN Healthcare Inc. versus IA Healthcare Services Inc. This case is involving, this case involves a non-solicitation agreement with the, with an employee. An employer, an employee with the plaintiff, uh, was a recruiter. It was this employee's responsibility to find travel nurses for the employing entity. The recruiter employee signed a non-solicitation agreement. The employee was separated and got a job with healthcare services doing the exact same type of work. A&M Healthcare sued and said, hey, hey, I've got a non-solicitation agreement here with this guy. You can't have him soliciting my employees. And there have been many cases where the courts have found that non-solicitation agreements are enforceable. But the problem that the court found here was that the employee's job was to solicit employees, was to recruit. And by preventing the employee from performing that employee's occupation as a recruiter, this was an unreasonable restraint on trade, unreasonable restraint on employment. And so the court here found that the non-solicitation agreement was not enforceable and that the former employee could solicit employees at will. So the takeaway we have from this one is when you're having an employee sign a non-solicitation agreement, be sure to consider the position and be sure to evaluate and make sure that the, you as a company are actually protecting your trade secrets. Because the reason why non-solicitation agreements are enforceable is because they relate specifically to trade secrets. The company is protecting its trade secrets. It's confidential information that it protects and maintains a secret. And in order for that information to rise to the level of the trade secret, the company must take reasonable efforts to make that information private, to keep it secret. So some cases that are pending before the Supreme Court that we just want to mention here real quick, we have for Lekin versus Apple. This is a case where employees would clock out and then as they, these are Apple stores around different malls and shopping centers. Employees would clock out, and as they were leaving the store, they would need to have their bags, purses, backpacks checked to make sure that employees weren't stealing anything. And so there's a question of whether that time spent between clocking out and getting the bag checked is time worked. So that's a pending case, and we'll, we'll see where that goes. There have been some court of appeal cases that say that time spent getting your bag checked is not compensable, but it's the California Supreme Court. Who knows what they're going to do? Goonwardeen versus ADP. This is an interesting case. This is not a lawsuit against an employer. This is a lawsuit against ADP, the major large national payroll company. Goonwardeen, or however it's pronounced, sued the employer for unpaid overtime and other wage and hour claims and sued ADP for the exact same claim, saying that ADP is responsible for a person's calculating a person's overtime and paying it appropriately. 
seems to me like a frivolous case, but we'll see what happens. And then we have Lawson versus ZB in A. This is a case involving PAGA. We have the, the EPIC systems case that says that arbitration agreements are enforceable, class action waivers are enforceable, but there's a question of whether this applies to PAGA, the Private Attorneys General Act. And so we'll see soon how the court rules with regards to PAGA and class action waivers. Stolzel versus State of California. Uh, this is a case uh, involving correctional employees. Correctional employees would sign in and then they would take a few minutes to walk to their assigned location and then they would start getting paid. So it's a question here of whether the quote unquote walk times are permissible. So sometimes employees will or employers will have an employee clock in or sign in at say 755 and then spend five minutes walking to their location and start getting paid at eight o'clock when they arrive at their location. So there's a question of how employees should be paid in that situation. And Stewart versus San Luis Ambulance, I only wanted to talk about this case just because in this recent election we had a proposition on this very subject. The defendant is defending a case, uh, defending a lawsuit for unpaid uh, meal breaks and for meal break penalties. And the defendant is an ambulance company. And ambulance drivers are often required to work a 12 hour shift and they're often required to eat on call, meaning if they get a 911 call while they're eating their lunch, they have to stop what they're doing and go attend to that call. And so it's a question here of how ambulance employees should be paid in that situation. The, uh, we, the proposition was funded and supported by San Luis Ambulance to try and change the actual written law to get the, the company off the hook for paying meal breaks. It did not pass, and so now the, the lawsuit uh, will continue. And that's it for a, a case updates and pending cases that we're looking out for. I'm now going to turn the time back over to, to Denise for some questions and answers. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, thanks for hanging in there with us today. We know that's a lot of information to cover. Uh, if you haven't already asked a question, you can put a question in the Q&A box. If we don't get to it because of timing restraints today, we'll make sure that we follow up with you. Um, in the meantime, if you haven't seen any of our previous webinars, we've gotten a couple questions about the Dynamex decision, and we have covered Dynamex decision and IWC orders in previous webinars. Make sure you go to YouTube and subscribe to the Ethos HDS page, and you will always be informed when we upload videos. We try to upload videos uh, from our previous webinars as soon as the webinar is, is done. So um, you'll never miss anything that way. So let's get to a, a couple questions. Um, there were a couple questions regarding um, minimum wage and uh, in the state or in our state and then in Los Angeles. Uh, Linda, could you go over the minimum wage issue for the employees that work in Los Angeles again? Is it the higher wage for all the hours worked or just the work, the uh, hours that are worked in Los Angeles? Um, Curtis may know specifically this, as far as I know, it's just for the hours worked in Los Angeles, but here's what the bigger issue is, because you could track that pretty easily, but the problem is really more on the sick pay when it comes to the city of Los Angeles, because you have a higher sick pay burden. So it gets complicated if somebody calls out sick um, on a day they're supposed to go to Los Angeles, how are you going to pay that, right? You could potentially have a blended um, overtime rate. You could have all sorts of other issues that come up. Personally, if I know somebody's going to be going to Los Angeles frequently, like we've got some clients that have people that go into Los Angeles to do contracted jobs, I would just pay them at the higher rate for the period of time they're going to be working there over if it's, you know, for the next month, the next six months or whatever. Um, I would try to do it as a block of time so you're not mixing pay rates in the same pay period, if that makes sense. Um, Curtis, do you know specifically whether or not, I don't think it triggers the need to pay 
them the higher rate for the entire pay period, does it? It's just for those um, hours, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, that that's correct. It's only the time actually spent within Los Angeles. So yeah. as as you said, if you have an employee who works four hours in the morning uh, in a, a non Los Angeles city and then drives to Los Angeles, works two hours, and returns back to the, the company's office. And those two hours would have to be compensated at the higher minimum wage. And the other six hours would have to be compensated at the lower minimum wage. And I, I, I completely agree with you. I think that the easier, less risky, more conservative route to do to take is to just pay the employee. If, if it's a day that the employee is going to go to Los Angeles, just pay the employees for the full day at the, the higher rate. Yeah, it's just and, the bigger burden just becomes all of the other stuff because you have to calculate the regular rate when you pay overtime you have to calculate the regular rate when you pay sick time and there's a higher sick pay burden so it's just you know it gets very screwy in the state of california when you have people who work in different locations Great. thanks for that um we had a question coming in regarding the um sexual harassment training uh, you mentioned, Linda, uh, the training and how the training has to roll out and the training for the number of employees you have. What if a company already provided an employee face-to-face um, -face training this year? What's their obligation then for next year? I don't believe that the law, I think the law reads that it has to be done by January 1st of 2020. So if you've done it this year, um, you should be okay. I don't know of anything that says it wouldn't be counted. Um, hopefully, they'll be better about clarifying that in the future. Um, you've, if you're already ahead of the curve, I mean, I don't see what the downside is, right? As long as you've documented it, as long as the training is compliant with all the requirements, um, I think that you would be fine. And then you would just be on the odd year cycle compared to everybody else. So um, good for you if you've already done the training. Just make sure it's documented. Um, and just keep in mind, you have to pick up stragglers that get hired or promoted within, you know, the first six months. Good to know. Um, changing gears real quick, we had a, <clears throat> excuse me, we had a question come in about uh, the um, human trafficking training. And you mentioned in the human trafficking training uh, that uh, specifically motels and hotels, is that that bill only for the motel hotel industry or is that human trafficking something that everyone has to be aware of and trained on yeah it's not for all employers there's some specific employers that are listed um, some sort of higher risk industries if you are hotel motel some hospitality um, I can't remember the whole long list off the top of my head but if you google that bill it'll pull up the list and then you'll know if you have to be compliant or not but it's the vast majority it's not like manufacturers for example things like that it's they know where it goes on they know like what to look for so uh yeah just google that bill or reach out to us if you want to know and we'll find it for you okay great and we had a question curtis um when you were speaking about the the settlement agreements and the confidentiality clauses. If our company is based here in California, but our employee is located out of state, let's say in Texas, does the same provision apply? Probably not. If the employee lives and works in Texas, then the, the substantive laws of Texas and, and federal law will apply and you and you can uh, sign in a settlement agreement with that employee that will be governed by the laws of the state of Texas. Great. Great. And Curtis, there was, um, Denise, let me ask Curtis another question that I saw sure. back here. Because um, we were talking about the confidentiality provisions, um, you know, in, the, in any sort of sexual harassment uh, settlement agreement. Can can the amount of money that's being paid, I think is the question, is the amount of money being paid, uh, can that be confidential? Uh, and, and from what it looks like, the answer would be no. Okay. So it's not just with regard to the sexual harassment allegations, but the amount of money, because I think that's true, right? Because that was already getting passed. Um, well, I know like 
Congress passed something, but I think that was specific to them um, mm -hmm. for a change, <laughs> but pro prohibiting you from doing that. Um, I'm recognizing yeah. the times. Um, sorry, Curtis, I'm recognizing the times already noon. Um, so if anybody that had a specific question on that, just reach out to Curtis. His email's on here. Um, if you have, a, if you were the one that wrote that question, just reach out to Curtis directly. I just wanted to quickly note before everybody leaves that uh, we have our next two webinars set up and we're going to be talking about leaves of absence. We're going to start in January with medical leave, so workers' comp, FMLA, that type of stuff. Um, and then the second part of leaves of absence will be like the other 17, literally. Um, you know, so bone marrow um, donation, you know, um, new parent leave law, like all of those we'll do in part two, which will be in February. So we've put the registration links there and you can watch for that in our newsletter as well. And with that, Denise, Curtis, thank you so much. Um, Curtis, thanks for your expertise on this. If anybody has any questions about the new laws, just reach out to one of us. And Denise, as always, uh, thanks for moderating. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.